How to Think Fourth Dimensionally. This is Neville Goddard's Out of This World. I'm going to break this book down, which I haven't done before on the channel. So I'm going to start now. I had so many requests on this. This is like one of the only books I haven't broken down of Neville Goddard yet. But it's actually my grandfather's favorite book by Neville Goddard. It was the first book that he read and the book that absolutely changed his life. So let's go ahead and jump right into this. And as always, I'm going to expound on these. And I love Neville Goddard's books and I'm so familiar with them so I can do a really good job at it. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it come to pass, ye might believe John 14, 29. Many persons, myself included, have observed events before they occurred. That is, before they occurred in this world of three dimensions. Since man can observe an event before it occurs in the three dimensions of space, life on earth must proceed according to plan, and this plan must exist elsewhere in another dimension and be slowly moving through our space. What this means is, have you ever had, you know, deja vu? Because your imagination, your mind, your imagination is always creating ahead of itself. That could, because imagination is God at work. When you're using your imagination, that is God at work. And it's, that is happening either consciously or unconsciously. It is creating your future, whether you know it or not, or whether you know what you're picturing in your mind and your feeling states and your energies and your frequencies, whether you know that or not, that's what's happening. So sometimes you will feel deja vu because those pictures have come up in your mind. So whenever you have that feeling of deja vu, that's because that picture has come up in your mind, but you just weren't consciously aware of it. But when it happens, you're like, boom, it connects to that imaginal act that you created before unconsciously. And you're like, oh, I've seen this before because you actually did. You just weren't conscious that that's what your mind was was creating. That's what your imagination was picturing. But when you get there in the three dimensions of space, because that ha that's all happening in the fourth dimension, time space. All this picturing and all these things is created in the world without time, where everything is already created. That's where the imagination works. So when you when this happens with deja vu, it's exactly what he's talking about here. You've pictured it before it happened. You just don't. You just weren't consciously aware of it. But when it actually happens in your reality, you're like, oh my god, that's deja vu. I remember this from somewhere. That's because you pictured it. You pictured it in your mind. You just weren't consciously aware of it. So that's how deja vu works. And I need to get a lot of questions on it. I've been wanting to cover that. So if the occurring events were not in this world, when they were observed, to be, lo to be perfectly logical, they must have been out of this world, which is absolutely correct in the fourth, dim fourth dimension of space-time. And whatever is there to be seen before it occurs here must be predetermined from the point of view of man awake in the three-dimensional world, which is true. Okay, so everything is predetermined. There is, There are no accidents. There are no coincidences. Everything is predetermined by your imagination based on your feeling states, what you believe to be true in your world and consent to be true in your world is then being pictured in your mind and then you're being led to that and you're transferring to the different parallel realities that match those frequencies and the energies and feeling states. So you're constantly shifting to different worlds. Like every fraction of a second, you're moving to a different world slowly. Whether it depends on which which way you're going, depending on what you are, your feeling states are, and what you consent to be true in your world, and your beliefs of your past, and who you are, what you consent to, what's your version of yourself. The world is you pushed out, and whatever is there to be seen before it occurs must be predetermined. Everything is predetermined. You're always imagining ahead of yourself, whether you know it or not. So thus, the question arises. Are we able to alter our future? Absolutely. This is where Neville Goddard gets into it. This is when my grandfather read this book, very the very first book he read, but imagination creates reality. And it's actually in his testimonial in the Law of the Promise. This is the book that he that he bought for from Neville Goddard that actually really made some big changes, including going to the VIP meetings with Neville, of course. My object in writing these pages is to indicate possibilities inherent in man, to show that man can alter his future, but thus altered, it forms again a deterministic sequence starting from the point of interference, a future that will be consistent with the alteration. This kind of goes towards the, um, the positron, which um, Richard Feynman won the Nobel Prize for. We actually have a certain amount of these positrons, which are they're, they're positive running electrons in the mind. And when you imagine something in the future, which we're automatically doing anyway, because they're always being activated, but you can actually control these positrons 
which was actually um, photographed in the cosmos. And actually, you can actually intentionally create an imaginal act or a scene to happen in your future. And when you make it real, you shock time sense with this positron. And then you and you're led to that that event that you created in the future. And you're going to get there. And that's what this is all based on is what he's talking about here. So the most remarkable feature of a person's future is its flexibility. It is determined by his attitudes rather than his acts okay so the effects and then the cause okay so your moods your feeling states your vibrations whatever you want to call this like your moods like what he says right here that is what determines your future because that is what you are picturing before it happens in the in the fourth dimension in time space you're automatically picturing ahead of yourself and whatever and these are all determined by your determined by your attitudes and your inner talking your inner dialogue which is created by that attitude so this is what's being led to the actions that you take in the world that you're living in based on the parallel realities that you're shifting to you're constantly shifting and this is where your future is being led and this is what when those pictures are coming up in your mind and it's all based on this. So the cornerstone on which all things are based is man's conception of himself. He acts as he does and has the experiences that he does because his concept of himself is what it is and for no other reason. Had he had a different concept of himself, he would act differently. His attitude would be differently. Your attitude would be different if you changed your concept or version of yourself. Thus, your inner dialogue changes, your picturing in your mind, your future changes. You start changing to these different parallel realities simply by changing your concept of yourself and your attitudes, your moods, and then everything is just dovetails. You know, then you start picturing different, your inner dialogue changes, and then you start shifting to the different world. And all of these things can be changed with Neville Goddard's exercises, which is imagination creates reality. And before you go to sleep at night, you picture it as if it's real, shocking the positron and then being led to that event in the future when you create it. So that's what he's going. And this is what my grandfather went over. And this is what shocked him so much because he thought that Neville Goddard was a fraud trying to teach that ma imagination creates reality. He said it was just absurd that Neville Goddard, and he thought Neville Goddard was a crazy man until he tried it and he read this book and he went to, you know, then he studied Neville Goddard or he did the exercise, the ladder exercise. He actually did it and climbed a ladder and then he was sold after that. Within, you know, a certain amount of weeks, he had like, like $50,000 in his safety deposit box in cash, like within a certain amount of time because he's visualizing falling asleep, counting $100 bills. So he starts visualizing everything that he wanted. And he got it all, everything. And he started really, really applying these methods. And that's really all it takes is you just have to do it. You just have to get in there and start imagining and start picturing these things before you go to sleep at night. So the cornerstone on which all things are based are man's conception of himself. A change of concept of self automatically alters your future. And a change in any term of his future series of experiences reciprocally alters his concept of himself. Man's assumptions, which he regards as insignificant, produce effects that are considerable. Therefore, man should revise his estimate of an assumption and recognize its creative power. All changes take place in consciousness. The future, although prepared in every detail in advance by your imagination, has several outcomes. At every moment of our lives, we have before us the choice of which of several futures we will choose. So he's talking about the, the infinite realities, like the parallel universes that we live in that we're constantly being shifted to. You have the choice of what world you're living in based on all of this. So there are two actual outlooks on the world possessed by everyone a natural focus and a spiritual focus. The ancient teachers called the one the carnal mind and the other the mind of Christ. We may differentiate them as ordinary waking consciousness governed by our senses and a controlled imagination governed by desire. We recognize these two distinct centers of thought in the statement, the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. Corinthians 2.14. The natural view confines reality to the moment called now, to the natural view. The past and the future are purely imaginary. The spiritual view, on the other hand, sees the contents contents of time, which is the fourth dimension. Because if you were to live, if you could live, if the human mind could actually fathom and live in the fourth dimension, fifth dimension, or sixth dimension in time space, 
you would have to know somebody like if i were living in the fourth if i were to know you in the fourth dimension i would have to know you i'd have to see you from the day you were born and to the day you died all at one time i could see everything all at one time that's the fourth dimension so we live in the three-dimensional time space so we're passing through the fourth dimension so i can see you now and you're say you're 20 30 40 years old i can only see you right then i can't see you from the day you were born to the day you died all at one time so that's basically the spiritual view so the past and future are a present whole to the spiritual view so that's the spiritual man the spiritual man lives and acts and imagines the fourth dimension believes in the fourth dimension about imagining a future event to take place and when you do this you enter into the fourth dimension and because it's already happened because if i because you've already lived and died you've already lived and died in your life in the fourth dimension you've already passed away we're just we're, we're like behind we're just passing through the fourth dimension like a movie like watching a movie that movie is already complete like it's already been directed and everything. The, the ending's already, it's already done. But you're watching it from the beginning. You're just passing through the movie slowly, watching it and enjoying it. That's what we're doing now. So, but you can go and change the end of the movie by knowing these things and, and with this spiritual view, by imagining something to be real to you right now, like you wanted a new ending of the movie. You wanted, you wanted to get the girl or the guy, or you wanted all the money, or you wanted the new career. You wanted the movie to end exactly how you wanted. Now you can just imagine it at the beginning of the movie, changing it, imagining it, and then you can alter your reality based on the parallel infinite realities that live simultaneously parallel to each other so you're constantly traveling these different worlds and then you shift to that world where that movie ends differently and there's a different version of you and all these things so that's the spiritual view so the habit of seeing only that which our senses permit renders us totally blind to what we could otherwise see so basically living not in the spiritual view but the natural view living in the natural view is the habit of seeing only that which our senses permit and believing that this is a solid reality so to cultivate the faculty of seeing the invisible we should often deliberately disentangle our minds from the evidence of the senses and focus our attention on an invisible state mentally feeling it and sensing it until it has all the distinctness of reality so basically this is how you shock the positron. This is how you create a new reality. This is how you shift to a different parallel reality with a new ending of that movie is by creating an invisible state. And you can practice this by dis deliberately disentangling your mind from the evidence of the senses and going into your own imaginal acts, having your own visions, going into meditation, disentangling yourself from the evidence of the senses and going into a different world and start picturing and imagining other things happening to you you're a different person you're, you're living in a completely different life and you can go into this and start creating these new vivid scenes in your mind and that'll transfer you and change the end of the movie that'll change your and alter your future so earnest concentrated thought focused in a particular direction shuts out other sensations and causes them to disappear we ha all we have to do is but uh, concentrate on the state desired in order to see it the habit of withdrawing attention from the region of sensation and concentrating it on the invisible develops our spiritual outlook and enables us to penetrate beyond the world of sense and to see that which is invisible so you start doing this start building that momentum and building those habits of withdrawing your attention from the 3d reality and focusing your attention on a invisible state like your new invisible version of you and creating this new spiritual outlook so for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen romans chapter 1 verse 20 the vision is completely independent of the natural faculties open it and quicken it Without it, these instructions are useless for the things of the spirit are spiritually discerned. Okay, so basically you can read these books, you can study the knowledge, but if you don't actually make an application of it, there may not be any changes for you. So you must apply yourself, start really using these, even if it's only for, you know, five, 10 minutes a day, start using them somewhat, you know, you'll start seeing the results for them, start developing this new confidence, start changing your beliefs when you start seeing the things start to happen. So when you actually start applying these things and you're actually like, wait a minute, I imagined that yesterday or I was imagining that last week, like intentionally and that just happened, that was really weird. And you start to be like, is this stuff really work? 
yes it does and you start realizing that and your beliefs start changing you be like okay so you start figuring out these other things that you want to have i want to have this or i want to have that i want to be with that person i want to have that career you know what i want to i want to live in a different house i want to live a different life so then you know i can create it because you've already done it now you start to see these things and you start then all of a sudden you become this new version of you where you're getting up earlier and you're doing all these things you're networking you're creating you're you're not consuming things anymore you're like you're you're wanting to dedicate a lot of your time to making money to start developing yourself start building a business and start you know increasing your ability to communicate and start developing new relationships you start changing this version of yourself so when you start actually just applying this even 5 10 minutes and start seeing some results That'll start changing your belief systems that it actually works because you'll start to see it start to work in your life and start changing things and you start manipulating your current reality and start changing it and it can get really, really fun at this point. So a little practice will convince us that we can, by controlling our imagination, reshape our future in harmony with our desire. Desire is the mainspring of action. So you must determine what you want, like what do you desire? Then you just picture it and you get it. So we could not move a single finger unless we had a desire to move that finger. No matter what we do, we follow the desire, which at the moment dominates our minds. When we break a habit, our desire to break that habit is greater than our desire to continue the habit. And that's absolutely true. So the desire, the desires which impel us to action are those that hold our attention. A desire is but an awareness of something we lack or need to make our life more enjoyable. Desires always have some personal gain in view. The greater the anticipated gain, the more intense is the desire. There is no absolutely unselfish desire. And this is even with relationships, and this is with getting a lot of money and things like that. There's always going to be some unselfish desire about that. Like you, like to get a relationship, most people want relationships because they, they like the way that somebody want, that loves them, they like the way that makes them feel. They, like, they want to feel loved. And that is somewhat of a selfish desire, but it's not a bad selfish desire. Not all selfish things have to be labeled bad. You know, you want to feel loved. You want to feel compassion. You want to feel these things, which is selfish, but it's not bad selfish. So there is no absolutely unselfish desire, whatever you're trying to create, but you're also doing the same in return. So where there is nothing to gain, there is no desire and consequently no action. The spiritual man speaks to the natural man through the language of desire. The key to progress in life and to the fulfillment of dreams lies in ready obedience to its voice. Unhesitating obedience to its voice is an immediate assumption of the wish fulfilled. To desire a state is to have it. To desire a state, to desire something, is to have it. As Pascal has said, you would not have sought me had you not already found me. So as soon as you desire something, like if you picture something in your mind or this unconsciously picture something that you want, you want a brand new sports car, or a new house or a relationship, you're automatically feeling that being done like in that moment. And that's what the, that's the mainspring of action. That's what pushes you to go get it. That's what motivates you because you just felt that. You felt the end, like you felt what it would feel like had you already had that thing. So then you want it, so then you're going after it. So then the motivation sets in because you just felt that desire being completed. And that's what Pascal is meaning here. So you would not have sought me had you not already found me. So you, you found the desire, you felt the desire, and that's why you're seeking it. And that's why you're going after it. So man assuming the feeling of his wish fulfilled and then living and acting on this conviction alters the future in harmony with this assumption. So then you're motivated to go get it and it's also being drawn to you if you can hold that desire as already being completed. So assumptions awaken what they affirm. So as soon as a man assumes the feeling of his wish fulfilled, his four-dimensional self finds ways for the attainment of this end, discovers methods for its realization. So then you're entering now the fourth dimension because now you're picturing it. So as soon as you desired something, your imagination automatically went into the fourth dimension, into the future, felt that desire being completed, and that's where the desire actually originated from, is from that feeling. Because if you couldn't actually feel it, then you wouldn't actually want it. Because you have to, just like Pascal said, you know, you would not have sought me had you not already found me. So you felt it, and that's what made it real. So you already traveled into the fourth dimension and felt that feeling in the future as if it was already done. So you just have to capture that feeling. 
Assumptions awaken what they affirm. So as soon as a man assumes the feeling of his wish fulfilled, his four-dimensional self is going to go to that and feel it and find the attainment of this end. If you can hold that feeling, so you capture that feeling, focus your attention on that feeling, and then it'll be drawn to you, attracted to you, and you're also going to do other things to get it. So all these doors are going to open, and you're going to automatically act towards and getting it and motivated to get it. So it discovers methods for its realization. So I know of no clearer definition of the means by which we realize our desires than to experience in imagination what we would experience in the flesh were we to achieve our goal. This experience of the end wills the means. With its larger outlook, the four-dimensional self then constructs the means necessary to realize the accepted end. The undisciplined mind finds it difficult to assume a state which is denied by the senses. So a lot of times you're unconsciously feeling that. So you don't actually know that you're that you're actually um, imagining the end when you have a desire. Like you you actually felt that desire as being complete, and that's what's motivating you. But if you can consciously recognize this, like understanding what I'm telling you right now in this video, you can then have a disciplined mind and then focus on that same feeling because you've already found the feeling. You've already found the feeling. If you desire something, you already have felt that feeling. So you just have to go back to that, then find that feeling, create that feeling, keep it close to you, and then hold your focus on this feeling until it actually happens. And then you can create like a mental movie or an affirmation that's based on that and picturing it at the same time until it actually happens. This will actually attract a thing to you really, really fast. And a lot of people are like, I don't know what it feels like. How do I know what it feels like to have these things? You wouldn't, you wouldn't desire those things if you didn't already feel them. If you couldn't feel the joy of having them already, then you wouldn't even desire those things. The only reason you desire something is because you actually pictured it already being done just for that split second. And then you had the feeling and you're like, oh, I really want this. Like whether that's a relationship, a new career, a new house, new car, whatever it is that, you're, that you desire, you have already felt, you've already pictured yourself driving it. Even for a split second, unconsciously, you've already felt that. Otherwise, you wouldn't desire that thing. So you've already found that feeling. So all you have to do is go back, capture that feeling, create a mental image of it, and hold it close to you. And that's why Neville Goddard talks about the undisciplined mind finds it difficult to assume a state which is denied by the senses. So you're now disregarding your 3D reality. So you're holding on to this picture. And no matter if somebody comes to you, you're never going to get that car. Or you don't have enough money for that car. Or you don't have this. Or you don't have that. You're disregarding. You're staying focused on this mental image of you driving this car. You've already pictured it. You've felt it. Now you've had keeping it close to you. And you're disregarding all these 3D circumstances that are telling you you can't have it. So that's a, that's a disciplined mind. And you have to have that according to Neville Goddard here, which is absolutely true. So the undisciplined mind finds it difficult to assume a state which is denied by the senses. Here is a technique that makes it easy to encounter events before they occur, which is call things which are not seen as though they were Romans 4, 17. People have a habit of sliding the importance of simple things, which this simple formula for changing the future was discovered after years of searching and experimenting. The first step in changing the future is desire. That is, define your objective, and then you'll feel it too. See, that's what he doesn't say here, but that's true. You will feel that desire. Once you desire something, you've already felt it. So know definitely what you want, and then you'll feel it, and then you'll desire it. Secondly, construct an event which you believe you would encounter following the fulfillment of your desire. This is where you grab it and bring it close to you. So then now you're constructing an event. Now that you've felt it, now you can take that feeling and now expound on that feeling and create a, a vivid scene that you would encounter following the fulfillment of that desire. An event which implies fulfillment of your desire. Something that will have the action of self-predominant, like it's already happened. Like you're, actu you're actually completing the action right here, right now. You're not watching it on a movie screen. You're actually in the movie. You're an actor in the movie driving your new car or whatever it is that you desire. So it's already done in your imagination and you hold on to that. So thirdly, immobilize the physical body and induce a condition akin to sleep. So just lay in an odd position as you're going to sleep at night. Like take 20 extra minutes before you go to sleep and lay in this position. Find that mental movie. Create that mental movie. Be disciplined. Disregard your 3D, the senses, all these things that are telling you you can't have it. 
immobilize the physical body and induce a, a condition akin to sleep. Lie on a bed or relax in a chair and imagine that you are sleepy. Then with eyelids closed and your attention focused on the action you intend to experience in imagination, mentally feel yourself right into the proposed action, imagining all the while that you are actually performing the action here and now. So you're in the movie. You're not watching a movie. You're an actor in the movie in the first person. All right, so imagining all the while you are actually performing the action here and now, you must always participate in the imaginary action. So that's, you're the actor in the movie. You're not merely standing back and looking and watching a movie, but you must feel that you are actually performing the action so that the imaginary sensation is real to you. It is, the imp it is important always to remember that the proposed action must be one which follows the fulfillment of your desire. So that's pretty obvious. And also you must feel yourself into the action until it has all the vividness and distinctness of reality. So keep doing it. Keep recreating it over and over. Be persistent with this because once you feel the vividness and the distinctness of this new reality, you will have it. It'll be done and you will get it. So for example, suppose you desired promotion in, in your office, like you're working at a job, you wanted a promotion at your job. Being congratulated would be an event you would encounter following the fulfillment of that desire. So having selected this action as one that you will experience in imagination, immobilize the physical body and induce a state akin to sleep, a drowsy state, but one in which you are still able to control the direction of your thoughts. So a state in which you are attentive without effort. Now imagine that a friend is standing before you. Put your imaginary hand into his. First feel it to be solid and real, then carry on an imaginary conversation with him in harmony with that action. Do not visualize yourself at a distance in point of space and at a distance in point of time being congratulated on your good fortune. Instead, make elsewhere here in the future now. The future event is a reality now in a dimensionally larger world, the fourth dimension. And oddly enough, now in a dimensionally larger world is equivalent to here in the ordinary three-dimensional space of everyday life. The difference between feeling yourself in action here and now and visualizing yourself in action as though you were on a motion picture screen is the difference between success and failure. Because if you're watching yourself at a distance, it's not happening right now. It's not, you're, you don't, you're not going to feel like it's happening to you because if you're watching a movie, you're seeing actors, you know, you're seeing all these actors take, doing all these things in this movie. You're not feeling that happening to you. You're feeling that happening to them because you're not actually in the movie yourself. So even if you were watching yourself in a movie, like you were actually an actor in the movie and you're watching yourself as an actor, you're not going to feel the scene like you would if you were actually playing the part in the movie. So you must feel as if it's happening to you right now so you're an actor in the movie you're an actor in the movie you're not watching yourself in a movie so the difference between feeling yourself in action and and visualizing yourself in action as though you were on a, a picture movie screen is the difference between success and failure so the difference will be appreciated if you will now visualize yourself climbing a ladder i know we've all done that exercise and anyone that's actually attempted this and really, really did it. They did climb a ladder, I promise you. And there's probably thousands of you watching this video that have done this. So then with eyelids closed, imagine that a ladder is right in front of you and you feel you are actually climbing it. Desire physical immobility bordering on sleep and imaginary action in which self-feelingly predominates here and now are not only important factors in altering the future, but they are essential conditions in consciously projecting the spiritual self into the fourth dimension and activating the positron, okay? So if when the physical body is immobilized, we become possessed of the idea to do something and imagine that we are doing it here and now and keep that imaginary action feelingly going right up until sleep ensues, we are likely to awaken out of the physical body to find ourselves in a dimensionally larger world with a dimensionally larger focus. So you're gonna, you can wake up inside of these in the fourth dimension and, and it's gonna be like automatically in this new movie, like in the fourth dimension. So it's gonna be a dimensionally larger focus and actually doing what you desired and imagine you were doing in the flesh. But whether you awaken there or not, you are actually performing the action in the fourth dimensional world and you will reenact it in the future here in the three dimensional world. So don't worry about actually waking up, you know, in that in that vision and actually completing the task in the fourth dimension. 
in the in your imagination because that is the fourth dimension you're traveling in the fourth dimension time space but once you do this whether you awaken there or not you are actually going to perform that in the the, the three-dimensional world eventually so you will reenact that in the future because you're you're that's when you've activated and shocked time sense with the positron so experience has taught me to restrict the imaginary action to condense the idea which is to be the object of our meditation into a single act and to reenact it over and over again until it has the feeling of reality. Otherwise, your attention is going to wander off and everything under the sun is going to be in your mind besides that. So you must restrict this imaginary action and be disciplined and hold it in your mind because your mind's going to try to drift off on you. And that's why we do all these different exercises, the leaf exercise and everything that helps develop this part of the mind, which I'll post at the end of this video. I'll put a card up at the end for the leaf exercise to help you this develop this ability if you haven't already tried that but this can act that exercise can absolutely help you i'll post that card at the end of this video so in a few seconds they will lead you hundreds of miles away the mind can do this it'll take you hundreds of miles away from your objective and point in space and years away in point in time so you must restrict that be disciplined and have that isolated ability to focus on one thing for long periods of time if we decide to climb a particular flight of stairs because that is likely event to follow the realization of our desire then we must restrict the action to climbing that particular flight of stairs. Should our attention wander off, we must bring it back to its task of climbing that flight of stairs and keep on doing so until the imaginary action has all the solidity and distinctness of reality. The idea must be maintained in the field of presentation without any sensible effort on your part. We must, with the minimum of effort, permeate the mind with the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Drowsiness facilitates change because it favors attention without effort, but it must not be pushed to the stage of sleep in which we shall no longer be able to control the movements of our attention, but rather a moderate degree of drowsiness in which we are still able to direct our thoughts. So you want to dedicate enough time and then lay in this odd position, like a position you wouldn't normally sleep in. That way you don't just fall, just nod off and fall asleep right away. So you want to do this, you know, you want to you want to set a specific amount of time and then you want to lay it in a position that you wouldn't normally sleep in. That way you can really, really work on this. So the most effective way to embody a desire is to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled and then in a relaxed, sleepy state, repeat over and over again like a lullaby, any short phrase which implies fulfillment of your desire, such as thank you, as though we addressed a higher power for having done it for us. So this will automatic, it's like, it's af like an affirmation. When you start repeating this as a, like a lullaby in this drowsy state, you're automatically going to picture the end result. Like, thank you. And you're going to, you know, you're going to have these beliefs as well that there's a higher power getting it for you. So you're automatically going to picture these things in your mind as already being complete. So you're going to, you're going to capture that, that feeling state. So if however we seek a conscious projection into a dimensionally larger world, then we must keep the action going right up until sleep ensues. Experience and imagination with all the distinctness of a reality. What would be experienced in flesh were you to achieve your goal and you shall in time meet in flesh as you met in your imagination. Feed the mind with premises, that is, assertions presumed to be true, because assumptions, though unreal to the senses, if persisted in until they have the feeling of reality, will harden into facts. To an assumption, all means which promote its realization are good. It influences the behavior of all by inspiring in all the movements, the actions, and the words which tend towards its fulfillment. So you're going to be picturing all these things that tend towards the fulfillment of your wish fulfilled. So to understand how man molds his future in harmony with his assumption, we must know what we mean by a dimensionally larger world. So this is where he breaks down the fourth dimension. This is really good. For it is to a dimensionally larger world that we must alter our future. The observation of an event before it occurs implies that the event is predetermined from the point of view of man in the three-dimensional world. Therefore, to change the conditions here in the three dimensions of space, we must first change them in the four dimensions of space. Man does not know exactly what is meant by a dimensionally larger world and would no doubt deny the existence of a dimensionally larger self. He is quite familiar with the three dimensions of length, width, and height, and he feels that if there were a fourth dimension, it should be just as obvious to him as the dimension of length, width, and height. 
A dimension is not a line. It is in any way which a thing can be measured. Okay, so that is what a dimension is. Something that can be measured in some way is a dimension. So you can add more dimensions to this. So the fourth dimension is time. You can measure time. You can measure width, length, and height. Those are all dimensions. So that's the four dimensions. That's three dimensions. Time is the fourth dimension. So that is to measure a solid fourth dimensionally, we simply measure it in any direction except of its length, width, and height. Is there another way of measuring an object other than those of its length, width, and height? Time measures my life without employing the three dimensions of length, width, and height. There is no such thing as an instantaneous object. Its appearance and disappearance are measurable, so that makes time the fourth dimension. It endures for a definite length of time. We can measure its lifespan without using the dimensions of length, width, and height. So time is definitely a fourth way of measuring an object. The more dimensions an object has, the more substantially real it becomes. A straight line which lies entirely in one direction acquires shape, mass, and substance by the addition of dimensions. What new quality would time, the fourth dimension, give which would make it just as vastly superior to solids as solids are to surfaces and surfaces are to lines? Time is a medium for changes in experience because all changes take time. It's measurable. The new quality is changeability. Observe that if we bisect a solid, its cross-section will be a surface. By bisecting a surface, we obtain a line. And by bisecting a line, we get a point. This means that a point is but a cross-section of a line, which is in turn, but a cross-section of a surface, which is in turn, but a cross-section of a solid, which is in turn, if carried to its logical conclusion, but a cross-section of a four-dimensional object. We cannot avoid the in the inference that all three dimension three dimensional objects are but cross sections of four dimensional bodies which means when i meet you i meet a cross section of the fourth dimensional you the four dimensional self that is not seen to see the fourth dimensional self i must see every cross section or moment of your life like i was, I was explaining earlier for me to know you in the fourth dimension i would have to see you from the day you were born till the day you died all at one time every event that occurred in your life i would be able to see everything at once which we which the human mind cannot fathom cannot correspond with that cannot understand that and see and do that otherwise it wouldn't exist so my focus should take the entire array of sensory impressions which you have experienced on earth plus those you might encounter i should see them not in the order in which they were experienced by you but as a present whole seeing everything at one time this is the fourth dimension because change is the characteristic of the fourth dimension i should see them in a state of flux as a living animated whole if we have all this clearly defined in our, and fixed in our minds, what does it mean to us in the three-dimensional world? It means that if we can move along time's length, we can see the future and alter it as we so desire. So this is the key here. This world, which we think is so solidly real, is a shadow out of which and beyond which we may at any time pass. It is an abstraction from a more fundamental and dimensionally larger world, a more fundamental world abstracted from a still more fundamental and dimensionally larger world, and so on to infinity. The absolute is unattainable. There is no ending. It never began and it'll never finish. It's just a circle. The absolute is unattainable by any means or analysis, no matter how many dimensions we add to the world. Man can prove the existence of a dimensionally larger world simply by focusing his attention on an invisible state and imagining that he sees and feels it. If he remains concentrated in this state, his present environment will pass away and he will awaken in a dimensionally larger world where the object of his contemplation will be seen as a concrete objective reality intuitively i feel that were he to abstract his thoughts from his dimensionally larger world and retreat still further within his mind he would again bring about the externalization of time 
he would discover that every time he retreats into his inner mind and brings about an externalization of time space becomes dimensionally larger. And he would therefore conclude that both time and space are unreal, they're serial. And that the drama of life is but the climbing of a multi-dimensional time block. Scientists will one day explain why there is a, an artificial universe. But in practice, how we use this artificial universe to change the future is more important. And I totally agree with this. You shouldn't focus on how it's artificial or how it's unreal, how we're not, how we're living in a hologram, which can be fascinating. But the main point about this is that you can use this to change your future, to, to create the life that you want to live and, and to be happy be fulfilled, have purpose, have loving relationships, and just create the future that you want. And that's what you need to use this. Don't, don't worry so much about why it's artificial and all these things. Don't focus too much on that. That is not the important um, aspect of this. So changing your future is. So to change the future, we need only to concern ourselves with two worlds in the infinite series. The world we know by reason of our bodily organs and the world we perceive independently of our bodily organs. All right, so that's the end of this chapter, but I'm gonna run through these three steps for altering your reality in an application form. So the first step in changing the future is desire. Define your objective, find your desire. What do you want and then feel that because you're automatically gonna feel it. If you desire something, you've already felt it. So just find that feeling, create that image and hold it close to you. Then we'll move to the second step here, which is constructing an event in your imagination, which you believe you would encounter following the fulfillment of your desire or go into that lullaby, go into that drowsy state and then repeat the lullaby. Thank you for creating this for me. Or, you know, like the magical phrase, um, thank you for showing me this issue is already solved. You can use that too. you know, creating this this passive state and then repeating this as if a higher force is creating it for you and then let, let the pictures come into your mind yourself or imagine it yourself. So number three, you're going to do all this in an immobilized state. So the physical body and induce a condition akin to sleep where you're in a drowsy state. So lie on a bed or relax in a chair and imagine that you are sleepy. Then with eyelids closed and your attention focused on the action you intend to experience in imagination, mentally feel yourself right into the proposed action, imagining all the while that you are actually performing the action here and now. You must always participate in the imaginary action. Do not look at it as if you're watching a movie. You're looking at it as if you are an actor in the movie in the first person. All right, guys, that's the end of this video. And don't forget to give me one thing you are grateful for or any other content you want me to cover. And we'll be moving into chapter two very shortly. So I'm going to create a playlist, a separate playlist for this book. So you can go back there and reference anytime that you want. All right, guys, I love you. That's the end of this video. And I'm going to post that card to the leaf exercise that can, uh, that can assist you in developing the, the ability to focus on your imaginary act and a feeling state, and then impressing that into the subconscious mind, just like we went over in this chapter, creating a new future, activating the positron and taking your life to the next level. So click on that if you need to develop your ability to focus on one thing and visualize. All right, guys, I love you and I'll see you in the next one. The only God is your own wonderful human imagination.